Good afternoon and welcome to the Possibility and Post-Secondary webinar. For those of you who I have not yet had the pleasure to meet, my name is Janet Tran, and I serve as the Director of the Center for Civics, Education, and Opportunity at the Ronald Reagan Institute. Our center works at the nexus of civics and education policy, answering President Reagan's call for an informed patriotism to ensure a more prosperous future for America. And at this year's Reagan Institute Summit on Education, or RISE 2021, our theme was disrupted from crisis to innovation. And leaders from various sectors, they discussed strategies to emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic stronger than before. Post-secondary education perhaps has seen the greatest disruption during this time and thereby has the greatest opportunities. Uh, traditional higher education still has a part to play in supporting uh, current learners, as well as colleges providing that stable infrastructure. However, how do we connect post-secondary education to honor the skills, the learning, and the goals of the current graduate? Today, we will watch a RISE panel featuring Dr. Ruth Watkins, President of Strata Education Network, Dr. Kim Hunter-Reed, Commissioner of Higher Education for Louisiana, and Dr. Shannon Gilkey, the Commissioner of Higher Education for Rhode Island, who discussed how higher education systems should look following the after aftermath of the global pandemic. Host panel, Dr. Dave Clayton, Dr. Nicole torpy Sabo, and Dr. Melissa Levitt are friends from the Strata Education Network. They'll respond with the results of their recent survey, reconnecting recent high school grads with their education aspirations. It is clear to us that the high school classes of 2020 and 2021 have endured massive disruptions to their education. So to examine these effects, Strata Education Network surveyed more than 1,000 recent high school graduates who postponed their plans to enroll in post-secondary education and interviewed a subset about their experiences. I hope you'll enjoy this panel and the discussion and share any questions you may have via the Q&A function of the Zoom webinar. So without further ado, uh, we will start this program. What an incredible opportunity today to think about possibilities in post-secondary education that have in fact been catalyzed through the pandemic. Uh, there is little question in my mind as a former university president that this past year, year and a half, has been one of the most challenging for leaders in post-secondary ed. Certainly commissioners have done a lot of heavy lifting through these challenges. And we're so fortunate to have two innovative commissioners with us today. The opportunities, however, through this time have also been great. Breaking down barriers that have been longstanding to innovation, to nimbleness, to change, creating opportunities for partnerships with industry in ways that are often difficult uh, without some catalyst for change. So this has created an opportunity for all of us to think about how we can achieve better outcomes through post-secondary ed, better outcomes for individuals and their families, better outcomes for communities, better outcomes for industries, states, and our nation. What an opportunity to have leaders with us today. I'm gonna to start with you, Dr. Kim Hunter-Reed. Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how you have worked with students and student support in your state, really thinking, how can we do better to help people who are struggling to stay in school, people who have left, people who need to return? Sure. First of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Excited to be a part of RISE 2021. Um, it is a critical question, obviously. The students are at the heart of what we do. I would say as we think about the pandemic, uh, sort of two parts to the answer. First of all, when we went sort of flipped the light switch in two weeks and went 100% online in higher education, uh, I saw call centers being stood up and students being contacted to say, do you need technology? What help do you need? How can we support you? And so when we looked at our retention numbers, previous spring to that spring, we saw that we lost very few students. We did a really good job. But then as the pandemic continued, uh, certainly working parents, student parents and others um, had sort of uncertainty and lack of predictability, affordability challenges. So those things all uh, exacerbated the challenge. So we have thought about in Louisiana, COVID is an accelerant to move good systems forward. But also we understand that COVID has as a result meant that students who were um, the, those individuals who were serving least 
were also significantly impacted. And so how do we think about women, minorities, low-income students as a state that's trying to increase educational attainment and that already has equity gaps? How do we lean into that? The other last thing I'd say is we did ask the students, what has worked in the pandemic for you? And as we move beyond the pandemic, what should we take with us? And what they said, of course, was hybrid personalized support. They now have that expectation. It's someone is going to say, how are you doing? How can we support you? What more do you need? Very wise asking the students about their needs and also addressing disparities. Commissioner Gilkey, let's hear from you about uh, your approach to help students. Sure. Well, I think, I think the pandemic taught higher ed uh, or at least surfaced up some observations. First, our institutions of higher education, they can mobilize themselves when called to action. I mean, I was working at a community college system during the heart of the pandemic, and we were doing everything from using our 3D printers to print face shields for our healthcare workers to moving about 100,000 students online within two weeks so we could deliver. And so, I, you know, one of the critiques of higher ed is the slow ability to innovate. When called to action, higher ed can be mobilized. So that was one observation. The second observation is that we learned the same hard lesson uh, during the pandemic and now that we did in the 2008 economic recession. And that is the significant number of folks who are dislocated when there are big economic swings in this country are those that don't have a post-secondary credential. The third thing that we learned is that business and industry are using the opportunity of the pandemic and, and, and other economic swings to pivot and integrate uh, more technology, whether it's automation, uh, whether it's looking at advances in technology to you know, provide their services or goods. Higher education needs to use this opportunity as well to pivot its delivery model so that we can meet that robust uh, workforce needs. So that was on the hearts and minds of how to deliver uh, a post-secondary education as an outset of the pandemic. That's very, very wise. I think, of course, not only our students had needs, but at your institutions, the institutions that you support and that your state, your state's economy need these institutions to remain vibrant and to meet needs. Um, do you have insights or thoughts about how you've helped your institutions be more nimble, innovate and weather this period? And maybe we gotta start with you this time, Shannon, go ahead. Yeah, well, I think it's number one, supporting our faculty and staff uh, to pivot their classrooms. When you look at the whole system of higher education, particularly the mass system of higher education, uh, we have a, you know, a lot of career and technical faculty around the country that need a lot of technologi technological uh, professional development, particularly in the trades, which is, according to labor market, a huge need in this country uh, to help them kind of do basic delivery in an online platform. Uh, the other thing is to support, uh, you know, in the pandemic, a public health crisis that we haven't experienced, certainly in my lifetime in higher ed, and, and maybe go back another one, uh, is how do you make sure that campuses are, are helping students and their faculty and staff not only be safe, but also feel safe so they can return and remain on campuses, uh, on their campus when personal learning to, to, uh, to, to re-engage in that. Yes. Kim, how about I you? I think that's very well said. Um, I would say from faculty, as Shannon has said, first we were saying, do you need technology support? We had faculty who love teaching online and faculty who said, I don't even know where the button is to do this. <laughs> and so we had to do some training. We used some stimulus dollars to provide some training for faculty. But then in this last legislative session, the governor said, we're gonna do a statewide faculty pay raise so that we can support the retention of our faculty. When it comes to students, we knew they needed predictability and stability, but also affordability. So we came forward and said for our institutions to do well, we need to use some stimulus dollars to reboot Louisiana, short-term high demand credentials for people who've been displaced, an adult promise program so that we have adult financial aid, $11 million more in need-based aid. So I think our institutions do well when we're serving students and meeting our students and faculty where they are. Uh, and that's policy and practice, but fiscal policy as well. That's remarkable ideas. I think the nimble use of resources to make sure that your institutions have what they need and can remain vibrant and relevant. Let's pick up on that thread a little bit, the thread about relevance and quality. I think the a big shift that many of us have seen in post-secondary ed is a discussion about what credentials are needed, what types of credentials, what are the workforce demands? What do our industries say they need? Um, as, as you pointed to, Shannon, uh, four-year institutions are not known for their nimble uh, adaptability, and yet 
we've seen interesting things and important things happen. So I'd like to pick up on what you have done in your work and in your states to better align workforce needs and the types of education and credentials that you are providing to help genuinely move people from education to employment. We can look at so much of what's happened in post-secondary ed and say, perhaps we have not done our work as well as we need to ensuring outcomes beyond completion of a credential. Too much, lots of focus on access that's relevant and will remain relevant. Completion, important, but what outcomes people actually achieve from that credential? I think you've both been working on this. Kim, let's hear from you. So I would say, first of all, Ruth, thank you for talking about the education to employment pipeline. I think that's important. You know, sometimes we'll have faculty who'll say, well, this is about citizenship. Yes, it is. But there are very few students I talk to who say, I just want to learn something cool. They say, I want to learn something cool, and then I want to do something cool with it, employment. So I would say a couple of things. One, immediately as we think about the pandemic and the short-term credentials, we did engage our regional economic developers to ask, what are the jobs of today in a COVID economy with a shuttered economy? You had to first figure out what were the immediate needs. And so we took time to do that and then align credentials to that. The other thing I would say uh, for us, uh, that's another example is undergraduate certificates. So our technology companies came forward and said, we love our liberal arts students, we need to plus them up. So why don't you think about an undergraduate certificate as well? So listening to business and industry, listening to regional economic developers, and then having the ability to pivot and to say to our institutions, here's where the needs are and let's think about how to do that. The other thing I would say certainly is healthcare, 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 and teachers, teachers, teachers. And how do we continue to advance that work? Uh, certainly as we move beyond a pandemic, but great teachers are the profession that makes all others possible. So we certainly have to think about those critical uh, areas as well and trying to get more students interested in being educators and healthcare heroes too. Thank you so much, Shannon. Sure. Well, you know, I think we've been in this uh, last couple of decades in higher education where, where most states have set post-secondary attainment goals. We certainly have one in Rhode Island. 70% of our Rhode Islanders have some form of a credential by 2025. But I think we have to shift that thing into attainment for, with a purpose, uh, with specific alignment with labor market. And the way I look at that is that it, can, it has to be coupled with both academic knowledge, but also technical skills. So that would be point one on how to be relevant. The second is this idea that, and this is why I think higher education matters more today than it ever has before, is this the, the, that higher education is a pursuit of truth and knowledge and civility uh, and having a place in our society where we can have disagreements and discourse. That is both a um, societal end, but it's also an economic and workforce end because employers are telling us the future of work, we need folks that can communicate, that can be tolerant in the workplace, that can have social emotional intelligence. Higher education or education in general is the bubble where that can happen. Mm -hmm. And that coupled with a, um, a labor market al alignment is I think the, 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 the way the industry needs to be responsive and, and have that value proposition to society. I do think, just one other quick point, Ruth, I do think that Shannon's previous point is an important one. We see it in Louisiana. The relevance of the credential is that you are more likely economically to be pandemic proof and recession proof. You have the luxury of working from home. You have good health care. You have discretionary income. So you, when things happen, you have that buffer. Those individuals who don't have the credential do not have that. And I think that's an important elevation of the relevance of the credential and the relevance of the learning is that it's not just about, certainly not just about institutions serving individuals well, but the result is that families and communities and states are stronger when more people have access to credentials. So well said. And I want to I want to pick up on this thread a little bit. I'm wondering about what kind of barriers you may have encountered as you worked with your institutions to move more in this nimble relevance ed to employment kind of pathway. And then how you've addressed those barriers, whether you've used incentives to help uh, motivate institutions to move in directions or how you've approached it and whichever one of you wants to go first. Thanks, Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so change is hard. 
and so I, I think we always have to acknowledge that. We have to acknowledge that this has been a really hard 18 plus months. And so we've done carrot and stick, right? We've talked about the expectations. I cannot tell you how many people have said to me or parents have said, it's just not high quality anymore because it's online. And so how do you think about a hybrid experience that is very high quality for students? And how do we meet that moment? I think that's very important. So we've certainly had to engage our institutions to talk about expectations of students uh, and families. How do you make sure that every course is not an online course? Is there a way for us in a pandemic to make sure students are safe enough to have some experiences on their college campus? Um, how do we make sure that there are resources to encourage uh, institutions to innovate and to reward those early adopters who have taken on the hard work. Uh, one example I would share from Louisiana is we wanted to redesign high schools so that more students graduate high school with an associate degree. And so we matched uh, dollar for dollar with our K-12 partners some funding so that every region of our state would have a pilot K-12 higher ed and workforce working together to redesign the 11th and 12th grade years so that students will graduate high school with an associate degree. So you have to reward early adopters. You have to bring partners together. And I think that that's an important conversation. But also it's possible because people say, here's a new expectation. We just can't do it the same way and expect different results. We have to get better. Yeah, that's so well said. Um, you know what? Higher education is built on a thousand-year-old model of uh, uh, students coming to campus. And I, we're at a population, at least in Rhode Island, we have about 52% of our population with some form of a credential. If we're going to reach that other 50%, 48%, we have to meet people where they are in local communities and get off campuses and figure out how to deliver higher education uh, with uh, a, a industry as a partner in a community by community. Um, we can't continue to do things the same way, delivering uh, on, with the same methods and expect to really have that mass uh, educated society that we all we all know that we need and higher education is really in, in, in our view or my view at the pivot point of that so i think that's the um opportunity there for us i think the um one of the barriers is that uh and i think i think one of the challenges right now that higher ed is experiencing is, is enrollment because of the pandemic across the country at our community colleges our comprehensive institutions and some of our research institutions we're not seeing that rebound of of enrollment, uh, maybe there's apprehension because of the uh, the safety of the campuses, or there's childcare issues for community college students, particularly women. Um, and so, I think that's an opportunity for higher to take a hard look at its delivery model and see new innovative ways to kind of close those those traditional um, ways that we engage students in the adult population and, and certainly our K twelve students. Well, let's pick up on that a little bit. I think the four year institutions, uh, and you both alluded to this have long rested on the thought that they don't actually prepare people for a particular career um, with a few exceptions, but for the most part that they're helping students learn durable evergreen skills that will last them through a lifetime, not to get their first job, but to invent their fifth job, right? Um, I wonder if you're seeing evidence that we might be at a moment where we are going to say, we must continue to do that and we can embed skills and wonder what you're seeing happen there, whether you're seeing those skills-based certificates be embedded in four-year degrees and what you might be doing to catalyze students' participation in those kind of skills. So you wanna go ahead, Shannon? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I think the, there's a, um, I think the liberal arts education has a huge opportunity to lead in this space. We know that general education and liberal arts education are the skills that companies look for when they look at management roles, when they look at leaders of, uh, you know, coming up with that next research and development idea for that new business. And so how do you couple that with career related, related experiences to get them that first job? And on the back end, when we have like our community college system, and I'm oversimplifying this, um, but when you have a community college system that is at the forefront of developing technical skills, how do you back this, those students into a liberal arts or general education so they can have those critical thinking, communication, social, emotional intelligence, all the value of a liberal arts education? How do we blend that together over the course of a career? 
not in maybe just a condensed two or four year period so that we have a much stronger, much holistic uh, workforce. Excellent. I would say uh, one of the things that we certainly have tried to think through, and it's a Colorado model that I'm certainly focused on in Louisiana, is blurring lines between K-12 higher ed and workforce. So you know students are college and career ready in high school because they have a college and career experience in high school. How do we think about work-based learning as a reality for every student so that they have an ability to navigate, an ability to see the world of work uh, early on? I think those things are very important because when we talk about underserved students, we talk about equity gaps, we talk about opportunity gaps. Students who don't know what they can be because they've never seen it. And so how do we think about system redesign that builds in those kinds of experiences as a reality for all students, not just for some? Um, and then also a conversation uh, that I've been having with a couple of institutions about um, the career services experience, right? It's a afterthought in the senior year, not a first thought in the freshman year. And so how do we talk about that and make sure that the students are having that conversation at the beginning? How do you monetize your passion? What do you know about your passion? How do you map your aptitude and interest to the world of work? So these are the conversations that I think are exciting for us. Um, and I would say on the flip side, as we see help wanted signs everywhere, we have to think about from the business partnership, how do we now uh, strike while the iron's hot and have businesses engage in making sure that they're upskilling workers and that be a way to recruit and retain employees? in a time when really people need more employees than ever before. So I think the deep partnerships are very important, getting out of our silos and really thinking about how to redesign the work, very important. If I'll pick up on that, because I think it's so well said, is I think this is how we turn the pandemic into an innovative space. First, let's con continue to blur those K-12 to post-secondary lines. If you think about it from a user end, a student, they don't silo out K-12 education or higher education. They just want a good education to go to that next part of their life. We do that as educators. We, we, we section and develop these little organizational structures to, to an end. And so let's, particularly in the K-12 to post-secondary transition space, let's break that down. You know, I started my career off as a high school teacher uh, tutoring students that we graduated from our high school that weren't ready for college level math. And, and we were just, just, you know, uh, disoriented and just flummoxed that this has happened, had happened. And I think a lot of that is because we, we've set this big gap in the structure of our education system between K-12 education and college uh, admission and, and matriculation. So I think we can reorganize ourselves through collaborative partnerships to, to really blow those lines. And the second thing is business and industry. Uh, there's a great tool called Talent Pipeline Management System developed by the U.S. Chamber to really look at supply chain technology to, uh, to back map uh, where businesses can look at uh, how to fill these gaps. Uh, we, when I was in Kentucky, we implemented it as a state and it really brought employers into a safe space to tell us what they need by industry across, well, in Kentucky, there's a little bit of bourbon. So by distilling uh, a little bit of horses, so by equine. So you really got to understand what is the pressures facing those industries uh, from the equine perspective, from the distilling perspective. And then you said, okay, a distilling industry needs electricians. They need PhDs in horticulture. They need biologists. And then you take a proactive strategic approach across your education system, K-12 and higher ed, and even labor and training to address those gaps. And I think those type of blurring the lines between K-12 education, business and industry, completely uh, the, the next wave of higher education. I would say these two commissioners are pretty remarkable. They've got fabulous ideas for the future and creating opportunity from a very difficult time. So many positive threads. I think internships, highly powerful, redesign of career centers, and probably having to think about paid internships because that's how we're gonna close equity gaps. You've both touched on the issue of genuine stackability which I think for the most part is a little bit more of a dream than a reality in many places, that we have um, a variety of steps and credentials that will meaningfully lead onward. I know, and I can say this as a, criti a critic of higher ed, as well as a member of higher ed, that too many four-year institutions have not valued credentials and things that students are bringing. And in fact, the incentives are almost all the other way to not value them. 
have you, do you have thoughts on how we can do better there and what you're seeing and trying to catalyze in your states to genuinely create and value the credentials and the learning that students are building along the pathway? So a couple of things um, in that, Ruth, and thank you for that. First of all, the mindset change in your question, I think, is an important one. It's not about seat time. It's not about the diploma as a proxy for learning. It is competencies and skills that we can demonstrate and that students can articulate as they move forward. And I think that uh, is a big shift and an important one that we have to think about. So how do we think about that work? How do we think about prior learning assessment? How do we think about stackable credentials? Um, these are conversations that we certainly are leaning into. I think some innovators, some are moving faster than others in this work. And none of us are moving fast enough for what the students need, adult learners, particularly as they come back. And so I do think this moment in time gives us an opportunity to reset. And certainly business and industry are an important part of this conversation. As I've said to many of them, you signal and we respond. And that's the reality in a lot of places when it comes to higher education and business. So when business says, we're looking for skills, we're looking for competencies, our job description looks like this. It's not the bachelor's degree, that's the first hurdle through the HR. It's clear competencies, that's a different conversation. Uh, so I think that's important as well. So I think all around the bend to your question, to the answer to your question, yes, we need to do more. No, we're not going fast enough. Yeah, I, I think understanding what a credential of value is state by state, you know, bringing together K-12, post-secondary, labor, commerce, uh, and how those things align and don't align. I think it starts with a simple um, uh, coalition of, of leadership that really maps that out for the state. And then I think it's uh, really a buy-in at the, at the operational level, the K-12 schools, the institutions of higher education to align those credentials of value. Uh, that has to be driven by where the state economy currently is and where it wants to go. Uh, so I think that's you know a, a way to operationalize that and then bring in the strategies of delivery to do that competencies and skills, which is not just, you know, uh, of course, a skill of uh, pipe fitting is a skill, but communication is a skill too, and critical thinking is a skill. And so how do we uh, redefine or evolve our understanding of defining what skills and academic knowledge looks like, and then braid those together to meet those credentials of value? And I think for this to work well, we have to get out of the ad hoc one-off approach. There has to be a more unified system and way to look at and value skills um, that doesn't require an individual evaluation of someone's credentials because the cumbersome nature of that is what has stopped it from working well for learners, I think for a long time. You've both touched on the role of industry and the, the way industry could be, is a partner with both of you and could be a partner if we think about public-private partnerships and ways that industry needs and industry's investment in talent might be able to help you as commissioners with your post-secondary systems. Um, let's talk about, maybe you could each give an example or two of where you see that collaboration and partnership really excelling and what you hope we can do more of looking forward. Yeah, we, we have an industry partnership with Electric Boat, which makes um, submarines for our, our, our Navy in the U.S. in Rhode Island. And we have developed a, an education center in Westerly uh, in Rhode Island to deliver uh, demand-driven, customized training and education to fill the pipeline of people at Electric Boat. Um, we're moving towards a submarine class that is significant in this country. And if you look at the projections of, 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 of pipe fitters and engineers that that company is going to need to fill our, to help fill our defense system, uh, it's, it's mind boggling. And can the education systems across K-12 and higher ed come together and fill that pipeline? So that's, a, I think, a public-private partnership that is um, exciting to see because it allows us to learn a lot about how we bring employee, employers into the conversation about talent pipeline and how we can expand, duplicate that across healthcare and cybersecurity and other key industries in this country. And hopefully those industries will want to help support students along the journey financially, because that is such a um, critical element, I think, of making this actually work. 
don't know, Kim, do you have examples? I, I would say um, probably one example, DXC in New Orleans, recruit, New Orleans recruited a, a technology company in. They came in and said, we need some very specific skills that we don't see. So they put together a university council, had faculty engaged, provost engaged, so that they could really build what they needed. So very specific intentional design on talent development uh, and then students having the opportunity to participate. So I think we have examples of that in our community colleges across the state, whether it's EMTs, healthcare, et cetera, um, where companies are investing and providing good feedback, real-time feedback to faculty about what the students need so they're work ready on day one. Um, but I do want to speak to your comment, Ruth, about system redesign, right? So we don't need just the one-off companies. Those are great. What we need is a full court press of business and industry sitting at the table with us talking about how do you, how are they advocates for education? How are they champions for workforce development and work-based learning experience? How are they financially resourcing the students and the leaders of the future? That is the kind of work that I think is sustainable and can really make a difference in terms of transformational change. And that's what we need at this moment in time. The students, our kids, college educated individuals, our kids are gonna like Energizer Bunny, they're gonna get there. But there's so many kids who are first in their family who have no college knowledge and America will not, our states will not be as great as they can be until we make sure the least of these have an opportunity to get that life-changing credential. And of course, it's also highly relevant for economic vibrancy in our states and in our communities. I've certainly, in my past life as a university leader, had some of our major national companies say, if you are not producing more graduates from diverse backgrounds who are working with the world and selling products to the world, we won't be able to keep a headquarters here. So it has, it has a very virtuous circle of relevance. I believe there's an untapped coalition of local leaders, mayors uh, around our states. I came from a grew up in a, a southwest county in Kentucky, a coal county, where the industry has by and large left without that next plan to refill it. And the same examples, there's examples all over the country in the Rust Belt in Rhode Island with textiles where the um, the economies are leaving, but there isn't something to backfill it. And we know that that is driven by of uh, post-secondary credentials and education and research development, it's all aligned. I think that coalition of le local leadership to, uh, and we know that local municipalities are getting a, an influx of stimulus dollars uh, uh, that are coming from the federals. How do we make the connection of higher education and post-secondary credentials helping that long-term livelihood of local communities? I think there's an untapped potential there. Very well said. So with our just couple of minutes left, Let's dream. Let's imagine the possibilities for better post-secondary education 2025. Post-secondary ed that delivers outcomes beyond completion of a credential to employment, to all the benefits that accrue with an educated population from health to well-being to economic stability and mobility. What would you want to put out as your North Star for how we get there? A hard question about, but let's think about what's possible and how how we move forward, taking what we've learned in this difficult time and perpetuating what we want to to get to that aim. So the North Star is obviously educational opportunity for all, uh, not some. So that means it's affordable, it's equitable, accessible. Um, and it's lifelong. And so you build structures around that to make sure that everyone uh, has that opportunity. Everyone doesn't have to have a four-year degree, but everyone should be able to map their aptitude and interest to the world of work and have access to a credential that is transformational for them and their families. And so that would be my North Star, not just because I know it'll make a difference for that graduate who we shake hands with or hug as they cross the stage, but their children and their children's children. So that's that's my North, North Star for sure. Yes, I'll just underscore what Kim said. It's attainment with a purpose that really couples academic knowledge and technical skills for, for everyone, not just a subset of the population in this country. Uh, and, and then I would also add that we have to really appreciate the fullness of how our institutions of higher education and our K-12 
sector develops the citizenry as much as it does develop the person with the skill sets to, to make that widget or work in that management position and make sure we protect, enhance, and grow that opportunity because we're going to have a, a, a much more tolerant society. Can't, you really can't beat this panel. These commissioners are great. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us to again refresh on that conversation that uh, President Ruth Watkins, Dr. Watkins, and Commissioners Kim Hunter Reed and Shannon Gilkey had earlier this summer. You know, there were some phrases as we think about that conversation. There was certainly discussion of the immediate need to respond to retraining and upskilling and disrupted workers and the experiences they'd had and the ways in which to invest those resources that had come with the Recovery Act and others. And it, we saw all that unfolding last year as we did regular weekly surveying of the American public and their experiences with work and with education. One of the interesting things we noted early on, this was in May of 2020, was that over a third of the American public said that they had changed or canceled their plans for additional education. And then as we moved into this, this time really just a year ago now and started to see the enrollment numbers uh, for community colleges and four-year institutions declining and dropping compared to the year before. And particularly then as the data started to come more and more, become more and more clear, we saw that individuals from low-income high schools were particularly less likely to enroll in college and to pursue post-secondary education. And as we think about inflection points in the lives of individuals, this just struck us as a vital a need to respond to these young people who had been on a path or had been intending to apply to college, but had determined not to or made a choice not to because of the circumstances in their lives around them through the pandemic. So from that, we undertook an effort where we first engaged uh, nearly 30 experts nationwide in a, in a working session, a virtual working session last spring to talk about the things that they were seeing in their states and in their communities and their organizations to try and respond to these young adults who were graduating from high school during the pandemic and were planning to go to college, but were not. What were the solutions, the responses? How are they staying connected to and supporting these individuals and their aspirations and dreams for more education and their plans? And uh, from that, we then took those ideas that were the experts in the field were pursuing. And we went and completed a survey that Nicole and uh, Melissa, two of my colleagues, will share results from in a moment that looked at what are the experiences of these young adults and how are they viewing their lives and what are they anticipating on going forward and what would be helpful to them as they think about their desires for additional education and for their life successes beyond high school. And so that's really led us to this survey. And I'll turn the time over to Dr. Melissa Levitt and Dr. Nicole Torpisebo to reflect and share with you those survey responses and some interviews that we conducted with those young people. Nicole and Melissa, thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dave. And um, yeah, we're excited to share some of these findings and to be able to share with you all um, the voices of some of these students as well. So, all right. So uh, first of all, just to um, kind of recap, or you know, we, we wanted to start off um, really hearing from these students themselves. Um, that's the whole point of our research is to get close to these learners and hear firsthand from them what they were feeling and experiencing. So we're just gonna start out uh, hearing from a few of the students that we interviewed. This is how I would put it. It was that one factor, and then it went it spiraled into a whole bunch of other factors. Because during the pandemic, it really just made you sit down and think about this and think about that and think about all these things that were happening around me. And it was just instead of getting better, it was getting worse. 
I, I definitely, it definitely took a year off of me going to school. You know, it's going to take me an extra year to get those classes done. You know, um, it took a huge toll on me, you know, mentally and emotionally. So we'll be hearing more uh, from these students throughout our presentation, but we just wanted to to start off, um, you know, kind of listening to them and, and understanding what the emotions behind some of these numbers really mean. So as Dave alluded to, these enrollment declines that we saw, um, they were startling overall, but they were even worse when you look at the equity consequences. So we saw that enrollment was down for um, schools serving high percentages of low-income learners. Um, so you see those uh, schools with high levels of poverty, they had about four times the enrollment drop of schools with low poverty. And then schools serving high numbers of minority students had about twice the enrollment uh, drop that schools with low numbers of minority students saw. So again, uh, as Dr. Reed said, the pandemic was an accelerant. We already saw large equity gaps in enrollment for low-income students and students of color, and the pandemic just really exacerbated these trends. So that was really um, the impetus for us to conduct our research study to find out, you know, what can we do? How can we better understand these students and figure out how to serve them and how to respond? So um, one thing we found, we asked students about the different steps they had taken in the process of enrollment to kind of understand where they got to before things fell off track. And so one thing that we found that was interesting was that actually Black and Latino students who were disrupted had gotten further in the process before disconnecting and deciding not to enroll in post-secondary education. Um, so we see that almost half of those students had actually applied to a college and um, about a third had even received an acceptance letter and yet still decided not to enroll in a college or university because of the pandemic. And we also see some um, differences in the types of changes that they made to their education. So overall, we know that uh, Latino students and black students were less likely to enroll um, due to the pandemic. And then we also see some other changes. So they were more likely to choose a less expensive program or to choose a program that was closer to home. Um, to have to alter their plans in these ways due to the pandemic. And we were interested in understanding, um, you know, there were a, a lot of factors, as our student Janine said, you know, the pandemic spiraled into a lot of factors. So really, what was it um, that caused these students to decide to not enroll in education right away? And what we found when we asked about what the largest influence on their decision it was really uh, stress and anxiety and uncertainty. So all these kinds of emotional uh, well-being factors that were, play the largest role in students' decision to not go on right away to education. Um, finances were another really major issue for about a quarter of students. And then you can see some of the other factors that also played a role. Um, and we did see some differences here as well. Um, we saw that, for example, for Black and Latino students, they were more likely to cite health risks of attending classes or need to care for a family member. We'll hear a little bit more about that um, in some of our, our other videos. But overall, we see that really these kinds of um, you know, stress and anxiety and financial pressures were a dominant factor for many, many students. So then we wanted to really understand if that was what caused students to delay their education, what kinds of support would be most helpful to them. So what we did is we asked students um, when they were comparing different types of resources and support, what would be most helpful to them in order to continue their education. And we really saw three themes here and we've highlighted them in different colors. One was guidance. And um, really this was the the top factor when students were choosing were um, to have an advisor to help them with things like enrolling in classes and figuring out financial aid, figuring out a pathway. And so we know that, um, you know, there's a lot of tech solutions in this space, but what we kept hearing consistently from students was the need for personalized guidance for a person who they could talk to, um, who could help them through these decisions, especially for students who may be the first in their families to go to college. 
The next theme we heard was about affordability. So financial pressures were um, a really big burden on many students. And so things like the ability to earn a wage, you know, to work while going to college at the same time would be really impactful, as well as easier access to financial aid. And then the last theme was really about more connections to career, more certainty about career pathways. My colleague, Melissa, will get into that a little bit more, but we really heard students wanting to, um, you know, as, as Dr. Reed referred to, wanting to know what they were going to be able to do with their education and how that was going to connect with their dreams. Um, some of these factors actually, again, were exacerbated by COVID. So students found it more difficult to find that guidance that they were looking for. And in particular, low-income students found it more difficult. So what we're seeing here is we asked students how COVID impacted their ability to find information about different options for education, about how to pay for education, and about how to apply for college. And so you can see many students said that COVID made this more difficult, but in particular, um, for students who had low income, they felt this lack of information and guidance even more. And then finally, um, when we ask students some questions about their perceived value of education and, and how successful they would be, we can see in some ways uh, students do believe that education would help them get a good job and that they could succeed. But where we are seeing a lot of doubt, um, not only in this project, but across our survey research, is in students' confidence of if their education will be worth the cost. And so that has to do with the actual cost of it, you know, the finances, but also the cost benefit. And so what kinds of connections they are seeing between their education and what it can do in their lives. So from here, I wanna turn it over to Melissa as we move from the survey data to a deeper dive where we interviewed some of these students to learn more. Thanks, Nicole. So as you were saying, given all that data, we wanted to dig a little deeper and hear students really talk about their decisions in their own words. So I'm gonna walk through what we found in our qualitative research. We're gonna start by looking at this word cloud that you're seeing here. And this really captures some of the phrases that students use when we ask them to describe how they feel about getting more education. When I look at it, two words jump out at me, worried and excited, and they're sort of of equal weight vying for attention. There are a lot of mixed emotions captured here. And when we spoke with students, they really helped us understand where that is coming from. So we're gonna hear a little bit more from students now. In the video we just watched earlier, we heard how the pandemic disrupted education plans. When you watch this video coming up, listen for how students react to that disruption. I think it was it was definitely disrupted. I know it was disrupted, but um, I know the mindset that I have now and the mindset I had in the beginning of the pandemic are like two separate mindsets. I was way like not motivated at all or determined at all to uh, you know like move forward or go to college or anything like that. But then I realized it's more to the picture than that. Like I have to, I can't just be stuck in this whole. The benefit in not going to a university immediately or not doing that right after high school um it is i have more time to think i have more time to really give thought to what i want to do in my future it's a great benefit and this is definitely having that time to really confidently figure something out the pandemic it's it was it was a time for a, a solitude for me uh, uh, it's it's changed the whole lot of things for me changed the way I think about the whole lot of things. I knew that I, 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 I came to accept that anything is possible. Yeah. You just have to uh, discipline yourself and work towards something. So these students are feeling disappointment and frustration, but there really is also the sense of purpose and resilience. And that resilience does signal that there's an opportunity to engage these students and help them get on a new path to their education and career goals. But we have to think about how that path has changed, what it might look like now, and what students will need along the way. So we're gonna show another video of students now. In this one, they'll be talking about what they need in order to reconnect to higher education. 
and recall those those same categories and those same kinds of supports that Nicole was just mentioning. Listen, especially for what they're saying about those, about their need for guidance, for financial resources, and for career preparation. It's it would be nice to actually give students the opportunity to actually explore on, on, on themselves and actually make the decision based on oneself. Be open minded and listen to the student um, and what what they are considering for their future, but to be considerate of like everything that they share, but to really give them options. When you have help all the time and you can always ask for help when you're doing something on your own, it's kind of like discouraging when you don't really know what you think you know. It was so difficult. Like I remember me and all my friends like trying to figure it out and we were doing it and like I had to teach them like, oh, look, you got to do this so you could like move on to the next step. It's, it's stupid. It shouldn't have been that hard. Um, but there was nothing in person and everything was online. They had no people to like contact these people interested in the classes. I would actually want someone to just tell me to move on, someone to motivate me never to relent, never to stop. Um, someone that could speak courage to me. And also, if possible, assist me financially. I Hopefully not like an unpaid internship because I know that those are hard. Um, but like an internship that would relate to my field specifically of genetics would be great. I want to know that I have the security in that school that if I need extra help or if that it's certain that this career that I want, I will be able to graduate and get that career. I want to be able to say, oh, if one career doesn't work out or something I learned about and it doesn't work out how I wanted to, I still have knowledge about another career so that I, you know, not be feeling like I'm stuck in one, you know, one tunnel. So what can higher ed leaders do with these insights from students? When we hear about the kinds of things that they're looking for, high impact guidance, financial support, a pathway to a great career, it can feel like a really tall order, particularly when we know that institutions are already working hard and they're delivering creative and innovative approaches to reach their students. The good news is that many of the practices that students are talking about are already at work in the field. And in fact, we heard many of them discussed by, by our panelists we watched before this conversation. So what we hope to do in sharing this data is really illuminate those connections between what students are saying and these strategies that institutions are using and can keep using to engage and support them. So for these next few slides, I'll be highlighting themes that we heard from students on these topics of guidance, finances, and career preparation. So on the left side of each slide, you'll see actual quotes from the students we spoke with. Each of those quotes really encapsulates a concern that we heard from many students. And for each one, I'll be pointing toward ways we can act with strategies and practices that can respond to that concern. So we'll start with guidance. One thing that we heard is be open-minded and we just heard that in the video that we watched. So I mentioned earlier that what we heard from students seemed like mixed emotions. They were disrupted by the pandemic, but at the same time they're rebounding and even showing their resilience by thinking about what's next and what do I need to do differently now to get where I want to go. We really hear that same mix in the way that students talk about guidance. They want to have the freedom to choose their own path. They want to be encouraged to find different possibilities. But at the same time, they really do want support when it comes to putting their plan into action. So how can schools act in response? We know that higher ed and the K-12 system plays such an important role in helping students develop their goals, explore their interests. That's going to continue to be important. And we can really sort of back that up by offering students concrete models of different pathways that could show a range of career possibilities and post-secondary options. If you look at that second theme there, we also heard that students want guidance and support that is focused on them, focus on the students. That really speaks in part to the same need for personalization. And it also speaks to the sense of isolation that some students may be feeling. They were cut off from the support systems that they'd usually relied on. We heard Vincent in the video talking about how he and his friends were huddled over a computer trying to figure out how to enroll in community college. And you can really hear the frustration in his voice, the way he talks about that. Students are hoping that they can find someone they can reach out to who can really help them through this process. So how can schools act here when resources can be limited, advising caseloads can be quite large? One way is to engage faculty, alums, even other members of the community in providing this support by acting in a mentorship capacity 
or being aware of the different services and resources available. So they're sort of ready to connect students to these resources. And in that way, they can actually um, kind of free the advising staff up, I think, for, to prepare for some of this more detailed and, and really personalized guidance. Tech solutions also came to mind, um, and Nicole mentioned this as well. We know that many institutions have had great success with chatbots and other on-demand resources, and some of the best outcomes that come from these practices are integrating technology with these personalized human high-touch supports. Finally, the last theme on this slide, students told us that they are looking for advice from people who have already done it. So that can mean current college students, alums, people working in a field that the student wants to get into. Schools can facilitate these connections through outreach programs, uh, social media outreach, even helping to curate some existing high quality resources and content online. Students would tell us that they're, they're going on YouTube already and just trying to find videos where they can see someone kind of explain the process or sort of talk through their experience. So I think that institutions can really use that as a jumping off point and make sure that students get pointed toward the best content. Let's go to the next slide. So financial barriers, another topic that is playing a huge part in driving enrollment decisions. As Nicole mentioned, it was the second most influential factor for students who decided not to enroll. These concerns about finances do go beyond the immediate circumstances of the pandemic. And what we found is that whether or not financial barriers drove the decision to postpone enrollment, it really was the act of postponing and having more time to think through things that really led students to scrutinize their options and think through ways to finance their education and mitigate the risk that they could see in doing that. So here on this slide, you, you see some of the key themes about finances. The first is very, very straightforward. Many students picked up on this theme of finances being the main issue or the major barrier to enrolling. And they said that they wanted to try and get their finances settled ahead of time, maybe to work first and save enough money before enrolling. That felt like a better option to many of the students we spoke with rather than trying to juggle work and school at the same time, because they're very realistic and they're very perceptive about all of the challenges associated with that. So they would value support, I think, in balancing work and school, whether that would be through coaching that works on a skill like time management or by looking at, at structural opportunities at the institution to integrate work into academics, such as through an on-campus job that can let students work within an environment that does support their academic success. You can see on the next theme, students told us loud and clear that they want to make sure that college is not a waste of time and money. And the sense was really that, well, if I don't know exactly what I want to do after college, how do I know the right decision to make now? And of course, when this uh, growing sense of uncertainty that sort of came upon them with the start of the pandemic, that question is, is I think, coming through even more uh, clearly. And I think when students say things like this, what we hear in between the lines is this enormous fear that they will make the wrong move now that could derail the future. So we can help students overcome that fear by providing financial coaching and guidance that gives them good information to base their decisions on. One of the decisions, of course, regarding finances that students are making is whether to take out loans. But you can see in that third quote there, they're worried about debt too. One student, um, Olivia, even told us that even if she sort of initially had some misgivings about not enrolling in college right now, it was reminding herself that she wouldn't be in debt that actually reassured her. Because these students are really well-versed in the drawbacks of different financing options that they may have seen others around them choose. And even scholarships and aid can feel unattainable. Uh, we heard students describe how it can be confusing to apply for them. There's so many different requirements and deadlines. And I think that those challenges can feel even tougher for students from families whose financial circumstances may have changed during the pandemic. So providing personalized support on the FAFSA or other applications can be a very effective way to act here. And we know from pilot programs and, and schools and organizations already trying that, that that the research really does show that providing the support can, of course, increase the chance that a student will apply for aid, but also receive aid and ultimately enroll in school. Um, let's go to the next slide. So there's a natural connection between thinking about how to finance college and what would make it worth it, that sort of cost benefit uh, consideration that really is all about what kind of a career will be waiting at the end of it. So students talked about how their career goals were a huge motivation for attending college. But being focused on career, of course, also means that they expect a lot from colleges in terms of preparing them for a career or for multiple careers, as the case may be, because one theme we heard was a sense of needing a backup plan and even being ready to pivot. Uh, Janae is a student we spoke with, um, and you heard her in the video. She said she's not sure what she wants to do, but she wants to be prepared. So if her career doesn't work out, she still has knowledge about another career. Even students who do know what they want to do for their career at this point 
they spoke to concerns that they could get laid off. One student described it as getting kicked out. He said he didn't want to have a job where he could get kicked out of and then he'd have to find new work. Many young people probably saw this happen to their parents, to others in their community over the past year, and they want to be prepared. So how can schools really prepare students for a pivot that could happen way down the line? And, and sort of as, as Dr. Watkins mentioned, preparing not just for the first career, but how to invent their fifth job. So one strategy, um, and our panelists earlier spoke to this, is really making sure that students don't wait until senior year to begin preparing for their career. And when career navigation starts in the very first term is built into that entire student experience, it can really give them more time and more support to think through that entire career journey. So what if college doesn't result in a career? That's a big fear we heard. It's really captured in that next quote. Students told us, I know people who have gone to college and then they couldn't find work. So when we think about ways to address this fear, it really affirms why these public-private partnerships, strong partnerships between institutions and employers are so important. Some students seem to think, or they, they were sort of expressing this fear that if they went to college, they would just be sort of on their own and would have to guess which courses or training an employer might find valuable. And then what about if they graduate, they apply for a job and they found out that they guessed wrong. We know though that that isn't the case and, and, and the panelists that we heard from spoke to some of these partnerships and connections. Colleges are bringing industry mentors into the classroom. They're aligning what's being taught with what employers need. And that is really helping students translate what they learned into a language that is relevant on the job market. And you can see in the next theme, students are looking for something that is going to give them an edge in the labor market. Uh, in the video, we heard Jamie say that she wants an internship, one that pays, hopefully, which is a very important point. Um, other students we interviewed talked about getting certifications on top of their degree. We spoke with someone named Thomas who said he wanted to study accounting and he's already planning to get that QuickBooks certification to kind of distinguish himself as a job applicant. So internship, service learning, other forms of experiential learning is one great way to help students get that edge that institutions can really support. Another way is showing students how they can be pairing a traditional degree with skills-based training and, and integrate um, certificates at the undergraduate level. Uh, let's see, so let's go, thank you. So that hopefully offered a little more context on what we heard and how we can act in terms of guidance, finances, and career preparation. Happy to get uh, more into what we heard during the Q&A. Uh, we do have one more video to show, and this one really underscores why it is so important to reconnect with these students. Because if we don't engage them, we know it's not just the next four years of college that they'll miss out on, it's really a lifetime of career and economic opportunity that's at stake as well. Um, so let's watch the Slack video. I don't think we have, do we have sound for this one? Yeah, I'm I sorry. Like I don't need. Let me, let me start that again. Sorry, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just ready for my career, really. Like I'm, although I'm really interested in education and learning more skills and opportunities, I'm just ready for my success. I feel like I'm prepared for it, and I'm just waiting for the next step. And I feel like I don't need to wait because I'm stepping into it by going to college, by researching these opportunities. So that's Janine, and she's really talking about why college is so important to her. She's talking about how she's eager and ready for her career and going to college is the best way for her to start that journey. So this focus on career is really informing every aspect of these students' college decisions. And I think Janine is really eloquently capturing why it is so important to think beyond completion when we think about how we can engage disrupted students. It's about reconnecting them to college, but also to the careers and to the lives that they want for themselves. So with that, I think we can start the Q&A. Good afternoon, my name is Michelle Faggard and I am an education policy assistant at the Center for Civics, Education and Opportunity. I also have the privilege of sharing some of our audience questions with our panelists today. And thank you so much for providing the student voice, as you all said, kind of the emotion behind the numbers. That was really great. Um, for our first audience question, what are your thoughts on CT and community college education pathways instead of four-year degree pathways? What role can they play in reconnecting our students? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's something we heard loud and clear from our students is that um, they don't want just one option or just one pathway. You know, they a lot of students felt very pressured from their counselors to just 
take that, you know, tried and true straight to four year college pathway. Um, but they felt frustrated because they weren't really learning about other options and figuring out what else might be right for them. Um, one of the students we saw, Vincent, actually decided to go that route. You know, he he had been going to go to a community college and then ended up deciding to get some vocational training instead. And he thought that that was a great option. So I think as um, Dr. Reed said earlier, you know, it's not that every single person has to have a four-year degree, but every person should be able to connect with a post-secondary option that's going to prepare them for the career that they're aspiring to. I would just add to, I think that those are all great points. And just to sort of underscore that when we talk about sort of how to prepare students for that meaningful life beyond completion that really cuts across all post-secondary sectors. And I think in some ways community colleges are particularly relevant to this conversation because they're a sort of a site of where we're seeing the biggest impact of the disruption. But I think that they're also one of the biggest spaces for innovation. So we're seeing the biggest enrollment declines at community colleges. That's really magnifying, I think, what we're seeing in terms of equity trends too. But then if we look like, if we look at what we talked about with support and financial resources and connecting to career, it's really community colleges that I think have the have been innovating in this space, whether it's through guided pathways or um, you know, policies to, to promote access and, and different kind of career program development to industry needs. So I think that um, as something that we're looking at, so it's incredibly important and relevant. And from the student point of view too, as Nicole said, they're absolutely interested in looking at, at all post-secondary pathways. Yeah, the only other thing, sorry, I just wanted to, um, to add on to that is that we don't see this as an either or. Um, it, it doesn't have to be either you go to a four year institution or you get some kind of a credential, you know, that's not a degree. But we're seeing um, from our research the real benefits of stacking these together. And so, you know, if you have just a high school education and add a credential, you see a benefit. If you have an associate degree or even a bachelor's degree and add a credential, that is work relevant, then students are seeing benefits to that. So that it shouldn't be this um, dichotomy between the two, but really how can those types of credentials enhance any kind of post-secondary pathway? Great, thanks to whole Melissa. Um, for our second question, there has been some recent data reflecting a big decrease in boys enrolling in college and the pandemic is likely to increase this trend. Given the focus on uplifting historically underrepresented groups, there's been some backlash at efforts to create programs specifically supporting boys. What are your thoughts on this issue and how can it be addressed? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a great question. And I think that this decline in enrollment among men is concerning. It's an important topic to consider. And I have a couple of thoughts on sort of how to approach it. I mean, one is that reversing this trend is really going to, I think, need to engage the entire education community. It's, it's partnerships with the K-12 system and it's being able to start that sort of college going culture um, at a younger level it, through, through the K-12 years. And of course, colleges, I think, have a role too. I mean, there we've read about some examples of really focused outreach campaigns that can try to sort of build up this enrollment. Um, the other point that I, I would make is that I don't think it's mutually exclusive from how we would approach how we can serve and engage underserved populations. I think for one thing, the decline in male enrollment does cut across race and income. So it's all incredibly important to look at um, in terms of equity. And then I think the uh, the principles of universal design theory can actually kind of give us some good insights here, which is really all about if we design interventions for groups who have been traditionally underserved by higher ed, it really will benefit other groups. So everything that we're talking about, career relevance, different kinds of financing and support, personalized guidance, I think that that will really help engage all groups um, so we can begin to sort of come to that to that issue of how can we engage um, men build up enrollment and really just strike that equity, I think, across all the populations. Mm -hmm. I'd say another point that I would want to add here is that this, the picture that we're seeing is a little bit more complicated. So it's absolutely concerning, you know, to see decline enrollment among boys. Um, at the same time, we're seeing on the other end, when you're looking at outcomes beyond completion, that, that um, women are still lagging when it comes to employment, when it comes to you know, making a full wage. And so in a lot of ways, this is all part of one story. It's all connected to education. So women know that they need to go to college in order to have access to the kinds of jobs that are going to pay a decent wage. You know, a lot of times the jobs that are available to people without a college education tend to be in fields that are male dominated. And so for women, the opportunity cost of 
uh, going to college is lower because if they don't go, they're not going to have a chance to make that money. Um, even when they do go, we see a lot of times women are in fields of study where they're earning less um, compared to their male counterparts. So I think we just need to look at equity in all kinds of ways. We need to make sure that um, the opportunities are open and we're not, um, you know, closing those doors for, for boys. Um, and at the same time, we need to, you know, look at all the, the equity concerns around those connections to career as well. Yeah, thanks for painting that bigger picture for us. Um, and our last question, how can schools and policymakers respond when they hear that stress and anxiety are a primary reason for students not continuing their education? Yeah, I, I think um, that's been a really consistent finding that we've seen across our research, not only um, this one focused on high school students, but we did some complementary research looking at currently enrolled students and what the biggest challenges that they face are. And they also named stress and anxiety as their number one challenge. I think it's it's true for all of us uh, during this pandemic that you know, um, we've all been kind of facing these, these sorts of problems. And we've seen a lot of colleges, you know, recognize this, um, you know, and, and step up with supports for students. Some of the things that we've heard are, you know, increased resources for mental health, but, you know, not only counselors, but, you know, peer mentors and counselors as well um, is a promising practice that we've seen. Um, and just, um, you know, as our panel was saying earlier, um, this is something that students are, are more and more coming to expect, you know, um, counseling and mental health is something that students are more open about now than they have been in the past and, you know, more willing to kind of demand and expect that of their institutions that they're going to be supported in that way. One, one point that I would add to that too is that I think it's about providing these kinds of resources and also um, we heard in the panel the importance of providing some sort of degree of certainty and stability and to the extent that it's possible to do that and the circumstances that we're living through and that any of that can come from the institution, there can be ways to kind of set expectations and try to get some certainty around the schedule and, and just help students kind of know what to expect and, and how to kind of navigate changes. And I think that this came up too. Um, uh, Dr. Clayton talked about the panel that we did with experts to sort of kick off this research program and, and that was some, those are some of the insights shared too. Great. Well, thank you so much, Nicole, Melissa, and Dave for joining us today. Um, we greatly appreciate your contributions to this conversation and to the education space in general. Um, we've had quite a few requests from audience members to share slides. Um, so perhaps we can do that afterwards. Um, but thank you to you both um, and a huge thank you as well to those who joined us on the webinar today. Um, we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.